It wasn't until I got older and I realized, wait, I'm out here isolated in this foyer with my own son that had disabilities, not being able to actually listen to any of the speakers or see who was bearing their testimony. They just push everybody out so that the people that are neurotypical and the right race and the right class, this is what this, this program and this church is set up for you. Everybody else, we're gonna pat you on the head and say we love you. Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. If you're listening only and you would like to see our faces, head on over to my YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness. I would love it if you could like and subscribe and hit the bell so you don't miss any episodes. We are dropping episodes weekly, sometimes bi-weekly. Definitely leave us your comments. If you have any suggestions of people that you want to see on the show, leave it below. And if we do get that guest, we will make sure to shout you out. So today's guest, I was actually a guest on her podcast about 20 minutes ago. We went live on her YouTube channel. It went really well. Uh, it was me and my mom. Uh, her podcast is called She Became Visible, where she has on women talking about their stories of deconstructing owning their womanhood and becoming strong, beautiful leaders in their community and just happy, healthy people. She also has a big platform over on Instagram and she shows that it doesn't matter your age, you can be healthy, you can be strong, you can be happy. And she just advocates for people becoming their own authentic self. So I'm really excited to have on the show. Thank you so much for joining me, Renee Steelman, aka Go Gray Dame. Oh, fabulous. Thank you so much. What a pleasure this is. I have to tell you, I admire your YouTube and your podcast. They're just so age eliminating. There is no age gap. There is no specific subject that is geared towards a certain age. It is all encompassing, as you mentioned, people that are deconstructing from any kind of a dogma or any kind of a fundamental religion, and it just appeals to all age demographics. So this is a pleasure and an honor. So, 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 so glad to be here. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, it's it's great to be on with a fellow creator, someone who was also raised in the same culty things. Yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. Renee here uh, was also a Mormon, and we're going to be talking about her deconstruction and her youngest child who has a disability and how that relates to the doctrine and theology and perspectives of Mormonism. And we're also going to be focusing on how she wasn't so invested in the church to where she almost felt like an outsider. She wasn't part of the cool kids club. So her deconstruction process was a little bit easier. And that's something that we haven't actually discussed on the show yet. Normally, we talk about people where their entire identity is wrapped up in the high demand group that they are a part of. And this is on a little bit of the other side. So paint us a picture of your childhood and what age you got involved in Mormonism. I have to say I had probably... Um, I had a great childhood. I, I grew up in the um, north, in the Midwest, just a little town south of uh, Chicago. And my parents were both, uh, they came from large families, small town, uh, very much my mother. Uh, her father was fairly absent in her life, but there, uh, my father's father actually abandoned the family, but they all had siblings that they clung on to, and that was their tribe, was their siblings. And so I grew up with tons of cousins and lots of family activities, and they were basically, I would say, Methodist. I had one uh, uncle who married, and they were very active in more of a Baptist uh, mythology, and they were actually my godparents. Uh, my, my aunt was very religious, but very uh, not crazy to where we couldn't get together for family things because she was, you know, uh, all evangelical or anything like that. But we just knew that she had a love of Jesus and, and it, and we could tell that that was part of their life. But my father's family, I grew up with a family that drank beer, played poker, smoked, <laughs> but loved each other. And so I kind of intuitively grew up with knowing that people are good people in spite of the fact that they drank and they smoked and they danced and they, you know, just just did all these things that in the Mormon world was like, ah, you know, 
Um, and my parents got divorced when I was seven. My mother remarried about six months later uh, to a, a beautiful, handsome English gentleman that was oh. refined. And he just brought class into our family, which <laughs> I, uh, my brother and I both kind of sat back when my mother kind of started to transform into this classic oh. English woman. And we were both like, what? What's, what's happening here? You know, it's like, we can see through this facade, mom, turn it off. <laughs> we know what's going on here. But he was a good man. And he, he and my mom joined the church when I was 12. And I think for me, the Mormon religion was a, another Methodist religion. I basically believed in Jesus. I said my prayers. I was taught to kneel at my bedside and say my prayers. My, my prayer just went from now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep to dear Heavenly Father. Thank you for this day. So grateful <laughs> for my mom and my dad. I mean, it yeah. went from this one rote prayer to another rote prayer. Let's be honest, you know. Um, and because I, my parents were divorced, I spent time with my biological father and his siblings. And I spent time with my mom and her siblings who also were very Methodist Lutheran, but she did have one sister that was a member of the church. And then she converted another sister and another brother. So out of her, uh, the eight kids in her family, she ended up with, um, there were four of them that ended up joining the church. Um, and so there was that, but I don't think the Methodist part of my Jesus Christianity ever really left. And that was more a part of me than the Mormonism part. Mm -hmm. The Mormonism part was you don't drink, you don't smoke. Yeah. The rules. And you don't play poker. Yeah. But the rest of it was still just Jesus, Jesus and God in a new language, Nephi, Lehi, Lamanites, <laughs> you know, new, a new language. But I think intuitively I was still Methodist. Oh, okay. That's interesting. I wonder then from that perspective, when you were that age, I mean, you, you're you old enough to really know what's going on and to study and all of those things. Were you excited when the Book of Mormon was handed to you? Were you excited to have another Testament of Christ? Or were you looking at this like, oh, this is fine, but I'm still going to search the Bible and read the Bible instead? We were basically Easter Christmas Christians. Okay. Yeah, we went to church occasionally. My mom was always kind of searching for a religion. And I remember when my brother and I, uh, we were like probably 10 or 11. And she said, oh, I'm looking into some other religions. I'm actually studying Catholicism. And I remember both my brother and I, with absolutely no knowledge of religion, but literally just from our, our uh, paradigm of the people that we hung out with, our kids, right? We're kids. We're both like, oh, yeah, we're not doing that religion. <laughs> you know, my friends that are Catholic, they're crazy. We're not. But absolutely no biblical or religious uh, dogma to back that up with. Yeah. Um, but so I never read the Bible. And then, of, of course, as you know, as Mormons, we don't really study the Bible. Yeah. Um, but I just it was a big I kind of just went along with things as they as they did. And because I grew up in a small town in Illinois, my girlfriend and I, who I met at church, we were the only Mormons in our whole high school. Mm. So it was more or less a social thing for me. It was like, oh, this is where my friends are. I'm going to go to seminary because I get to talk to my friends there. And I got to ride in the car to drive to seminary with people. And then we kind of dispersed and we all went to our different schools and we just kind of did school stuff. And so church very much was Wednesday night mutual, uh, Sundays in the morning for Sunday school, and then you'd go back in the afternoon for sacrament meeting. It was more my social life. Okay. And how I was, how, what I believed in, and, and how I was supposed to act in that social life. Yeah, that makes sense. When you had this perspective of people who are Catholic, I wonder if your friends at school or people who knew you had that same perspective of you as a Mormon. Did you feel like you were treated differently because you were Mormon by your non-Mormon friends? You know what? I don't think so because I didn't have a lot of friends. Uh, I literally was a, I'm one of these people that had, um, I had some friends. I, there was a, a pack of friends actually that I felt like I hung out with. But I don't know if I ever felt like I was one of them. Mm. And I think that was because I was a Mormon. I think they welcomed me in, but I didn't drink. So it's like I went to the party, 
but I drove. Yeah. Because I was the one that wasn't drinking. And, um, but then I found out that there were times when they had separate activities that I didn't get invited to because I was a Mormon and I didn't drink. And so it was like, yeah, she's probably, and I don't know whether they did that out of kindness. Like, well, she won't feel comfortable because we're all high school sophomores that aren't supposed to be drinking. So, you know, we just won't invite her. So I felt left out of a lot of social things. Um, and then once I got into high school, I had that one friend from church and her and I just spent every waking moment together. It was just the two of us. And then she went to a different high school though. So it was just kind of one of those things. So I always, I never felt really like part of a pack um, because I felt like the church kept me out of that um, just because of the social life that a little LDS kid has versus, you know, other kids in high school and what they're, what they're doing to grow up and socialize. Yeah. I definitely know that feeling of not being invited yeah. somewhere because you don't do the sinful things that they want you to do, but wanting to feel righteous about it. Like, well, it's a good thing that I'm not around those drinkers, but then That's also right. feeling left out and like, but I want to be invited anyway. <laughs> I know, especially since I bought the beer. Like I, I always looked, I looked a little bit older, right? So I could go into the grocery store and I could buy the beer and then I would get back in the car and I'm like going to the party, but I'm like, do, 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 do. Are we done yet? Can we go home? And then we go home and I remember, you know, putting the girlfriend to bed and being like, why is she crying? She's so, oh, nobody loves me. Oh, no. And I'm like, that's a weird behavior, you know? But I do think that, and, they're, and it's so funny because I'm friends with them now on, you know, Instagram and Facebook. And um, they're just the greatest people in the world. And, and they were my friends, but I never felt quite accepted. And I'm yeah. sure it's because socially I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And that's maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. So I'm noticing that you were kind of sitting on the fence because on one hand, you didn't want to get so involved in Mormonism because you weren't really a fan of it. So you weren't really accepted as much by those people. And then on the other hand, you you were kind of on their side too, but not enough to where they would fully accept you. Did you just feel like you were just wandering between both and not really knowing your place? You know, what I felt is, and I think this is also a little bit about family dynamics. I have my mom had three children. She had my brother and I, and then she had from, from the same father. And then she had my younger brother from with my stepfather, who's eight years younger. So, and me being a girl, and then also having three years between my older brother and then eight years from my younger brother, I felt like an only child a little bit. Mm. I always had my own room. I spent a lot of time in my head and on my own, listening to music or reading books and things like that. So I always felt a little bit like I was kind of on my own anyway, just kind of living in my own little dream world. And I never really did everything that everybody else did. I, I just kind of didn't follow that path. And I don't think I did that consciously. I just think it was because I lived so much in my little dreamland uh, of my own, you know? So, and I also think I was so, 17 when my parents got transferred from Illinois to the Pacific Northwest and when we they moved my basically what was my senior year in high school so I had a few friends there but my true friends were the three friends that were my age at church yeah. who went to a different high school so I did church because that was those were the friends that we all everything we did together was authorized the church dances girls camp dance festival, road shows. Those were all the things that we did together. And then things that went on at, at school, and I didn't have anything to do with that. So that was my social life. Oh, okay. So then talk me through what it was like after high school and you're kind of moved on. Do you still keep in touch with these friends? Do you find yourself doing, did they have, did you do like the young singles ward, young single adult ward thing? No, I don't think they had that back in the pioneer days. Um, the <laughs> actually, yeah, actually no, because we, we, they followed the path. Um, let me think now, two of the friends went off to BYU. One of the friends stayed and had gotten a job with a dentist and had become a dental assistant. So she stayed back with her 
job as a dental assistant. And then I had plans of going to Dixie College mm. to, they had a flight attendant program oh. and I wanted to be a flight attendant. And so I got accepted and told my parents that I was accepted at Dixie College. And they were like, well, that sounds great. How exactly are you getting there and how are you paying for it? And I was like, I thought you were going to do that. Yeah. And they were both like, yeah, we're not doing that. And I, I even asked my biological father, would you help me pay for college? And he was like, why would I do that? You're 18 now. I don't have to pay child support anymore. Absolutely not. Whoa. You know. And so because my mom had come from a family of World War II veterans, both my aunts were uh, in the Navy. I have an uncle that was in the Army. I have another uncle that was in the Air Force. And one day I came home from the post office and just jokingly, I had picked up a pamphlet that said, you know, join the military, serve your country. And I flopped it down and said, you know what? I need to lose 10 pounds. Maybe I should just go to boot camp. And my mom was like, that's a really good idea. <laughs> and knowing, knowing my mom the way I do now, I'm sure her first thought was, I don't have to pay for it. I won't have to feed her oh, any longer. Wow. And, you know, she's out of our house and no longer am I financially responsible. And so I did. I joined the Navy and oh, wow. um, went off to boot camp and then was finally uh, after my training was stationed in Japan. So I've never really kind of followed this. The only thing I will say that was very like on point for Mormon girls was I did meet my husband that summer. Uh, between my senior year and going active duty, uh, I met him in July of um, 72. And he already had his mission papers in. And I had already joined the service. So I had a commitment to go active duty in January. And so we both dated for the summer. And then I said, bye bye, see you in two years. And he said, bye, see you in two years. And, and so because I had a military obligation and he was going on a mission, we couldn't get married, but I would have, if he would have been a return missionary, I would have gotten married <laughs> at 18. I know I would have, but I kind of remember having the thought that I was like, boy, am I glad I joined the military? Cause I really love this guy and I really want to marry him, but I kind of want to go do my life a little bit. And um, yeah. so I was kind of glad that I had like somebody else saying, you can't get married right now. And I was like, okay. So <laughs> yeah, so I, have, I don't think I've ever really lived a real conventional Mormon life, but in a way I did. Okay. But you did get married. Yeah. He came home from his mission. I got a 30 day leave. I came back to Portland. We got married three weeks after he got home from his mission. <sighs> he went back to Japan with me as a dependent, as a military dependent, and got put in the branch presidency. And I was like, here we go. I am on the Mormon wife path from that oh, point wow. on. How long were you in Japan for? So I was in Japan for two years. And then my husband was there for a year. And then um, I got discharged and we went back to the Oregon area. And that's where we lived most of our Married life was in the state of Oregon. I find it interesting that we both moved our senior year of high school to Oregon. <laughs> I know. And, you know, I look back on that now and I think that was really cruel to move a child their senior year of high school because packs have yeah. already been made, right? Those, those, little, those little clicks, nobody's letting you into that click. And um, so it's it's hard, but my parents moved around a lot, so I kind of got used to it. Well, I think we have a lot in common in that sense, and that's probably also what forged our path to becoming so independent because there was no one else to rely on. Yeah. And I I was the one that told my parents, okay, I'll, I'll move to Oregon. And the reason why is because I did a lot of search pondering and praying with the scriptures, and I did the whole like flipping to a scripture and putting my finger down and looking at it, and it was... I don't know, I made it mean that I should move to Oregon. <laughs> and so so I was oh like inspired gosh. by God to move to Oregon. But I found it to be an adventure. And once I got there, I was like, well, I don't want to stay here. I want to go somewhere else. And and it kind of nurtured that independent lone wolf spirit uh, that I think you have as yeah. well. One of the things I love so much about your story is how you were really able to see through the BS from a young age. And then you carry that through into your adult life when your intuition was telling you that, hey, this church is not a healthy environment for me. It's not healthy for my kids. 
And it's so important to be able to follow your intuition. In fact, I had on a guest, um, Ashley Easter. We did an episode where she talks about how she was raised in five different cults. She had this incredible intuitive awakening and was able to get out of that. And now she is happy and healthy and she's actually an intuition coach. So if you're into that, if you're into wanting to tap more into your intuition, she does these free text messages every day and uh, they're intuitive text messages. And if you want to receive those, you can text the word intuition to 917-809-7311. I personally love following my intuition. I think it's helped me so much in in my life, especially after leaving a high demand cult where they teach you not to follow your intuition. Absolutely. And you know, I think the difference between you and I is it sounds as though you were really, really scripture, scriptures, prayer. I was more prayer and I didn't actually read the Book of Mormon until I went into the to, into the Navy. I got into boot camp and I got really ill when I was in boot camp and I ended up having to have emergency uh, mm. surgery. So while I was in the hospital in boot camp, I thought might be a good idea to read the Book of Mormon. I mean, I've gone through four years of seminary. Seminary to me was one big social party. It's like, oh, good. I get to talk to my <laughs> friends today. So I hadn't actually read it until I got there and I read it. And I remember closing the book in the hospital room and going, I should probably read this book again someday when I'm really thinking about it. I just, I didn't really absorb it. I wasn't concentrating on it, but I read it. I read the words. Um, so you had a, a much more uh, spiritual, I was more just fun and games and prayer was a big thing. I did, I did even pray um, at my, on my knees, at my bedside, even when I was in boot camp with other girls sleeping and their bunk beds around me. And I'm like, I got to say my prayers, but that was more my Methodist upbringing. As you say, we said grace over the food. We said prayers every night, uh, single prayers. We didn't do family prayer until after we joined the church. But, um, so prayer was a big thing, but I also didn't have a big scripture type study thing in going on. So that's the difference between you and I, but we definitely, we got married and the plan was, We'll go back to Japan. I'll get pregnant. Then I'll get an early maternity discharge. And then we'll go back to Oregon and start our life. And that didn't happen. It took me about almost exactly a year to get pregnant. And there was at one point when I thought, okay, what's happening here? Because my patriarchal blessing said that I would have children. I really wanted children. I, I think coming from a small family, I really wanted to have just a bunch of babies. And I loved children. I loved babies. I babysat all the time. And so, but my, I had the surgery, um, that I, that I had was I had had a cyst and I had to have the cyst removed. Mm -hmm. They also had to remove one of my ovaries. So I was absolutely terrified that I was not going to be able to have children. And I, I do remember going to our, going to church, going to fast Sunday, having babies blessed having people come up to me and go, how come you're not pregnant yet? Are you guys trying to have children? And, you know, silly comments mm -hmm. like that. And, and just really being like, this is, I don't like this. I don't like this feeling and what's happening here. Just kind of like, okay, well, we'll just see what happens. And then uh, on our way home, we stopped off after I was discharged. I, we stopped off to visit my parents in San Jose, California. My parents lived, um, they had a swimming pool. And so we were staying in the guest room, which was right outside the swimming pool. And the smell of the chlorine, I was like, Whoa, the whole time I was there. And I said to my mom, I think I might be pregnant. She's like, absolutely, you're not pregnant. And I was like, why do you think I might not be pregnant? I mean, but that's a whole nother episode on mom issues. But anyway, I was. So, yeah. So on my first child's birth announcement, it said made in Japan. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. I had easy pregnancies uh, besides morning sickness. Uh, we have six children. Our kids are anywhere from 18 to 23 months apart. I loved labor and delivery. I loved every part of having children. And my original intention was to have 10. Um, it slowly went down to eight. What? And then when I was pregnant with my six, then my oldest son was nine at the time. I remember going, you know what? This is harder than I thought it was. I don't think I want to have any more. 
And I didn't know at the time that the, the child that I was carrying uh, was going to have a very difficult birth, have some major uh, physical birth defects. I had no idea, but just intuitively, someone was saying to me, this is it. You're not having any more children. This is, you're done. Mm. Uh, but I didn't know that at the time. But I do remember saying to my husband, I don't want to have any more kids. I think this is going to be our last and he was like, oh, oh, he didn't care. But then I said, and I have natural childbirth with no drugs or intervention at all. So you need to go get fixed. And he was like, oh, oh, I can't. And I was like, what do you mean you can't? He literally went and got the handbook because he was in the state presidency at the time. And so he had access to the handbook. This was before the days that we all and he actually got the handbook out and read me the scripture that said you are not allowed to get sterilized or have any kind of, uh, you know, permanent birth control done for a man. Whoa. It wasn't, I don't really remember them saying anything for women, but for men, you are not allowed to have any kind of permanent, you know, birth control done. And I said, so are you planning on having another family somewhere? Because I'm done. He goes, well, that's just what, you know, it's what the, it says in the handbook. So I can't have a vasectomy. It's against the church. So... Because I had an emergency cesarean, I was able to say to the doctors, and while you're in there, mm. let's do a little sterilization. So so we knew for sure we wouldn't have any more children. And as it turned out, it was a huge blessing because he was severely disabled and his his birth was pretty traumatic. So that kind of changed mm. the whole trajectory of our family for sure. Yeah. And you were raising your family in the church, right? Yeah, totally. hundred percent. We had just um, moved and we were in the, we were living in Northeast Portland at the time, which again, I felt almost like there was an intervention because he was born we at a hospital in Portland, but immediately taken to Oregon Health Science. And we were so close to the university hospital that they were able to do the life-saving surgery they needed to do for him. And I just thought, wow, if we wouldn't have moved to Northeast Portland, we, you know, this would have been much more difficult to go up to the hospital and visit him and all the things we had to do. So I almost felt like there was some kind of intervention there. I, I have had, this is what's interesting, uh, Shalise. I've had so many experiences like that where I felt like there was intervention, but yet I don't have any problem not believing in a gray bearded, white haired man <laughs> as my father in heaven. I have no problem mm -hmm. not understanding how the universe works, but accepting that there might be a higher power of some kind. I don't know whether it's an energy or ancestors or what it is, but I'm okay with whatever it is. But I've had, I've had spiritual experiences that did not sway me a bit to understand the difference between a spiritual experience and earthly betrayal. So I think that's yeah. fascinating. Yeah, and I definitely want to get into what it was like when you were deconstructing and how you rectified those spiritual experiences. But first, I'd like to talk about what it was like raising your family in the church and what the church's teachings were on disabled children. I don't think that's something that we've covered on the podcast, and I'd right. like people to get the full scope of that. Yeah, I think at the time, I'm trying to remember, I'll look it up, when uh, the prophet Harold B. Lee made the comment about um, his opinion, which he relayed as from God or almost like a revelation from God, was that children that were born with disabilities, the reason why they came to earth and are utilizing dysfunctional bodies is because in the pre-existence, they were not valiant enough, but they were so desperate to have a body, which which is what the, the Mormon church teaches, that in order to progress and eventually end up in the celestial, which is the highest kingdom that you will live, you know, that you have to attain if you want to live with Jesus and God, you have to have a body because you come to earth for the experience of being tested and you can't be tested unless you have a body. So, so spirits that live in the pre-existence, um, come to earth and are given bodies determined by how valiant they were in the pre-existence. So if you happen to be very valiant, you will come to earth as a white male born in Provo, Utah. 
if you weren't quite that mm-hmm. great, you you might be, you know, you might have been born into a tribe in Africa somewhere and we got a body. So just be grateful. And then when it comes to people with disabilities, you were not valiant enough. And so you will take a body, but the body will be defective. So that was Harold B. Lee's teaching. This is one of the prophets of God. Right. I don't remember hearing that specifically. Um, but I remember reading it later on when my my son was older going, what? But I grew up with more the mentality that he was so valiant in the pre-existence that he had to come and take on a body that was defective because that way he doesn't even need to be tested. He's so perfect. He just had to cross off the got a body checklist. And mm-hmm. even, even though that is a changed doctrine that was meant to give people more comfort, to me, it was almost more violent because my son lived in a body that he was, he lived for 37 years before he passed away last year. And mm-hmm. he was in pain constantly and had no way of communicating. He was cortically blind. He relied on his hearing. He had no control over any of his extremities. He couldn't sit up. He couldn't walk. He couldn't feed himself. He couldn't flick a fly away or scratch Mm. an itch if he wanted to. And so the idea that someone would take on that body because they're so perfect and so valiant that they don't need to be tested is absurd and really cruel. I realized it more, not with my own son that had disabilities, but as I've aged and I've watched other families with children that have a various spectrum of disabilities And I've watched how isolated we are. I knew that I was isolated, but I just felt like very, like I was unique. Like it was my choice to sit in the foyer with my son in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. Nobody was making me do it. It wasn't until I got older and I realized, wait, I'm out here in a wheelchair or in the foyer, not being able to actually listen to any of the speakers or see who was bearing their testimony. I'm out here isolated in this foyer because your building is not adaptable to people with disabilities. And I have a hard time getting into the building because your building is not adaptable, but you're the one that told me I should have a large family and, um, but you're not adapting to people with large families. You know, I found it more when I had a grandson that was on the spectrum And he came to live with us for a while. And so, of course, we baptized him. We put him in the cub program and he didn't fit in. He didn't fit into the cub program because he had a sensory disorder and the chaos of a cub meeting was too much for him. He would put his hands over his ears and he would get angry and he hated it. Mm. And taking him to primary, the singing was too loud for him. And, And so I saw that with him was like, wow, you don't fit in here. Not only do you not fit in because of your sensory disability, but you don't fit in because you're a big kid. And he was a little disarming where, you know, you're that much taller and that much heavier than all the other eight-year-olds. And so he was kind of pushed away and not really accepted. And so I thought, oh, you don't fit into primary. And, you know, all this other little girl is out in the hallway with her uh, mom because she doesn't fit into young women's and they just push, they just push everybody out so that the people that are neurotypical and the right race and the right class, this is what this, this program in this church is set up for you. Everybody else, we're going to pat you on the head and say, we love you, but you're kind of messing with our program here. So it, it took me a while Again, because the people were so wonderful with my son. They loved him. They accepted him. They welcomed him into primary. Um, When he got older, it wasn't, then it was kind of like, could you just kind of, you know, he's a little loud. Actually had, we, we actually had somebody say that to us. Could you take him down the hallway? He's a little loud and we can't hear the sacrament. We're like, wow. You know, so that kind of opened my eyes. It, the joy of aging is that you experience more of life to where you can step back and go, oh, I get it now. I get how not having the perfect family, you're excluded, or the perfect skin color, or the perfect economic situation. You don't quite fit in with us. And mm-hmm. um, I, I really definitely saw that and learned a lot through having a child with a disability. 
Yeah. And your story is important to tell because people who are in the church and do have a quote normal family and normal experience have absolutely no idea why people like us would be upset about our experiences, right? And even I had a quote normal experience until I was pushing the boundaries. And then all of a sudden, I don't fit in anymore. You're not spiritual enough. You're not worthy enough. And that's when people start to recognize, oh, this can be a really difficult place for people. But it takes showing people a new perspective and saying, I know that your life seems to be perfect and church is wonderful for you, but have you ever stopped for a second to consider that if you don't fit into this box, then it's not going to be wonderful and it's going to be actually the opposite. It's going to be harmful and really difficult. And it makes those people start to think, is this what God really wants for me? If this is God's true church, is this what he wants for me to suffer, for me to belong to a church that doesn't create space for all of his kids, no matter what disability, no matter if you're neurotypical or neurodivergent, if you are straight, gay, trans, whatever, There isn't room for that. And so I think it's important to tell these stories and to expose the inconsistencies in God's true church or whatever church or high demand group that someone may be a part of just to show that there is room for love if you create the room for love and there is room for acceptance if you allow the acceptance to come forth. And that's that's really what I'm trying to do here is expose exposing those inconsistencies and showing people that there are holes that need to be filled and there's work that needs to be done. And if you don't like that, if it's not okay for you, if that environment is harming you, it's okay to move on. It's okay to find a different place that is accepting of who you are in its entirety. So at what point did you decide that this environment wasn't working for you or your family? Well, you know, it's very interesting because I honestly believe that if our son would not have had the disabilities that he had and it put a burden on the family, especially put a burden on me and it changed my life completely. If I would have had the neurotypical Mormon family with all of these, like you say, heterosexual children that followed the plan that was laid out or shown, you know, basically laid Mm -hmm. out for everyone, I probably would have had eight children. I I probably would have uh, just supported my husband and everything that he did. I would have followed that path, but because my children didn't follow the path, they, they weren't the acceptable kids. They were all just great kids that did their own thing. And there were, you know, the little whispers and, you know, and, uh, but we knew they were great people. And we, and I started to see through my children, the hypocrisy I saw men come up to my husband and say, are you spending enough time with your son? Because he seems to demand a lot of attention. It makes me wonder if you're really spending a lot of time with him. And I'm like, excuse me, I'm in Young Women's with your daughter and you might want to check where she's at Friday night, you know? But so this facade of this fake family, I started to see through that. I saw that my husband was living a very patriarchal order where I'm in the hospital. I've just had our sixth child. Um, he's in one hospital. I'm laying in another hospital. My husband is in the state presidency and he didn't miss a meeting. He didn't miss any high council things that he needed to be doing. He did every, he went to every meeting that he was supposed to go to and left me alone in the hospital because he was fulfilling his church duty. And, um, and no one from the stake presidency said, Hey, you know, gosh, didn't your wife just have a baby? Isn't, isn't that baby up at the Oregon health science having surgery and shouldn't you be there? And he's like, no, no, they were like, no, you're right where you're supposed to be serving the Lord and sacrificing and being obedient. And because he's that kind of a wonderful, kind, obedient person, he was like, I will be blessed. Our family will be blessed because of my service and sacrifice And that's what he thought. And I went along with that until I realized, wait, I'm dragging six children to church by myself because he's over visiting another ward and speaking in their ward. I have a son that has a wheelchair, oxygen tanks, and five other crazy kids by myself. But again, I was like, this is my sacrifice. I'm supporting my husband. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. It took me until... 
honestly, until my husband retired, we moved to Arizona to live our new retired life. And all of a sudden it hit me that he gets to go on to the next phase of, you know, the third act, as they call it, the third act of life. And my life is exactly the same. It's like, oh, you're not working anymore. You're playing golf. Oh, you're not in the bishopric anymore, but you're in the elders quorum presidency. And guess what I'm doing? I'm packing a diaper bag, getting a kid bathed, putting him in a wheelchair and taking him to church by myself, like I've done my whole life for at least Mm. 37 years. And one day I just said, I don't like this and I don't think this is for me anymore. And I don't want to be a part of this patriarchal system that serves you very well and doesn't serve the female voices at all. And so it was a combination of having those feelings, visualizing and seeing it for myself, living it, but then finding out more about church history that verified the patriarchal system even more to where I was like, Oh, not only do I not believe it, do I not intuitively believe it, but literally I've been betrayed and lied to. So it has to be a soup. I think it has to be a a combination of ingredients that get put in to where you finally go, oh my gosh. So, and again, my children, all three of my other boys had left the church, um, my one of my daughters was in the process of going through some hard things because her daughter or her first husband had been killed in a car accident and she remarried, but wasn't able to get remarried in the temple because she was already sealed to her other husband. Mm. And, you know, so then it was kind of like, wait a minute, I was married to this guy for four years. I've been married to this guy for 12 years but I'm sealed to this guy and our children supposedly belong to this guy. Yeah. So it was another patriarchal system where people were literally congratulating her husband for sacrificing his life to marry a widow that was sealed to somebody else. It's like, wow, you are a great man. And so it's, it's, it's the aging process of maturity that you, your eyes are open and you go, this is garbage. This is crazy talk. So that's kind of how it went. So right now I have uh, out of my six children, um, my perfect child has moved on to the next phase of existence, whatever that is. I don't know where he is. I don't know what, I don't have a belief in a life after death. That's for sure. I don't think anybody really knows what happens to us after we die. Um, And then my other three boys are not members of the church. And I have one daughter who is a fabulous, nuanced, progressive, active, lovely, ex-missionary, wonderful member of the church who's raising her four kids in the church. And they are beautiful and it is lovely and it is fabulous. And then I have another daughter that is seeking out Christianity in another form. And uh, it works well because we all love each other and accept each other for who we are and what we believe and it's um it's beautiful that is beautiful and i think a lot of it has to do with you as a mother though because not every family can have those beautiful dynamics and be so diverse in their beliefs and i think if you weren't raised the way that you were raised and you didn't have that strong sense of who you were growing up and like you were mentioning before, loving your family no matter what they believed, I don't think your children would have had the ability to model that same behavior. So kudos to you Thank for you. <laughs> for being able to pave the way for them to have the understanding and the love that they do. And kudos to you for also finding what works for you now. I mean, oh. you're kicking butt out there, doing, <laughs> doing a thing, being a strong voice for other people to look up to, to continue to pave the way for people to look up to you. And yeah, I mean, what, how do you feel now? What, what lights your fire and, and what makes you feel whole and connected? I feel very grateful as, as, as you say, I feel very grateful for my Methodist accepting, loving background that I wasn't raised in a seventh generation Mormon pioneer family. Cause I, I do feel as though it was the, the fact that, um, You know, my oldest child is a lot like his mother, unfortunately. He's very independent. He's very impulsive. He's very like, sure, I'll try that. Why not? 
And it made life a little difficult for the other kids, you know, when they were trying to live the Mormon timeline and he was like, whatever, you know, Um, (laughs) but because we loved and accepted him. And then when my girls got to be older and it came time to go to homecoming or prom or whatever, I'd be like, yeah, here's the deal. You have an amazing body and you are wearing that strapless dress because you look fabulous. (laughs) And, and so that's how they grew up. You know, we go to Hawaii, my girls, you know, I'd say that you should get that bikini. You have a tiny little waist, which I never have. I don't know what side of the family you got that from, (laughs) but you would look great in that bikini. And so they, they were almost like always saying, mom, I can't wear a bikini. And I'm like, yeah, we're in Hawaii. You can wear a bikini, you know? And so now we're all adults. They all have children. We have 14 grandchildren and we Mm. all accept each other for our quirky weirdness. And I'm so grateful that I had, like I said, a nice Methodist upbringing in the Midwest, you know, with cornfields and crickets and (laughs) things like that. And I wasn't raised in a weird bubble that taught me to hate my children if they didn't eat homemade white bread and, you know, it, it's just, it's crazy that, and I'm like, whew, dodged a bullet there. But yeah, it, we, we have the best family. My, my, um, as I mentioned, my youngest son passed away in December and we did a celebration of life and we didn't have anybody. And it was beautiful because my husband being the wonderful person he is did not, did not say, look, we have to have it in the steakhouse. We have to have the bishop speak. We have to have three songs. We have to have, you know, he he let me do what I w- wanted to do. And so we had a, a celebration of life in, in an event center. My five other children all spoke of their life living with this beautiful brother that they had. And, mm. uh, and then we had a DJ and we danced and it was so fun. And that's, that's what um, living outside of the dogma allowed us to do was to celebrate him and all accept one another and love one another for who we are. Isn't that, isn't that kind of ironic because that's what they teach that the church gives you. But in reality, it's kind of the opposite. Yeah, that's beautiful. What are your perspectives now that you've released that dogma on the way that they taught disabled people were in the preexistence? How, what are your feelings or where have you landed when it comes to that? Unfortunately, I wish that I could give more space and that I could live in a more of a gray area and accept people for where they're at and for their beliefs. But I, I have a lot of black and white thinking that I have to deal with. And I have a lot of resentment for a doctrine that's taught that makes people feel less of themselves or separates families. And so I have a hard time tolerating any kind of um, thought process that puts me against you or us against them or anything like that. So when I hear or when I read a dogma from other prophets about people, where they're going after they die or why they're living the way they're living, uh, why their life uh, existence is dependent on who they were in the preexistence, your skin color. Uh, when I hear that, I have a really hard time accepting that other people think that they can have it both ways, that they think that they can accept it, carry the water for the patriarchy, carry the water for the dogma, but not drink it. I have a hard time accepting that. So to me, it's like, I'm out of here. I I can't live with accepting any kind of fallibility or we don't, don't know, or it was their time or whatever, Mm -hmm. especially when it comes to the amount of autism that there is. I have a grandson that has autism. I have a couple other, you know, kids that are on the spectrum of autism and for any kind of a judgment to be put on anybody that doesn't fit some kind of a standard in God's eyes is not acceptable to me. And I, Mm -hmm. I can't nuance it in any way. It's like black and white. No, that's wrong. Yeah, it sounds like you have a healthier view of these these different types of people that, according to the church, are not normal or did something wrong in the preexistence. And I imagine that would have helped when your son passed over, helped your perspective and helped give you more peace as far as your current beliefs. Is that true? Or how, how do you feel? Isn't that funny? Because I had as usual, as, as typical Americans, 
where I think there is a strong Christian uh, uh, belief in America, uh, a lot of even strangers, people who don't know me, don't know anything really about me, reach out on media, on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and with love in their hearts, offered condolences in the form of, well, just know that he's with Jesus, or just mm-hmm. picture him running into the arms of Jesus, um, or just know that he's in a better place now, or just know that he's with God. And these are all meant to be kind and loving and comforting. And it's funny because I thought, you know what? I'm more comfortable knowing that I don't know. Mm. All I know is what I had for 37 years and that what he brought our family was amazing and beautiful. And I'm so grateful for what he gave us. And I don't know I don't know, but I've watched a lot of YouTubes on people that have experienced a near-death experience, and there seems to be a lot of similarities between these people. There might be another dimension. It might be an energy force. I don't know, but I'm excited. I'm excited to find out. I don't have to know. I'm just like, oh, this is going to be really interesting. I can't wait to find out what the next part of existence is, whether even if there isn't. I don't know, but I'm happy and kind of excited about it. Oh, I love that. I think that's a really intelligent place to live because it just leaves more room for maybe I get new information and I can change my beliefs accordingly. And I think that's a smarter way to go about life than to be so sure that no matter what comes your way, you're not changing your mind. And as you said, it's exciting. It's exciting to wonder and be curious about it. So I mentioned earlier, we were going to bring this back, your spiritual experiences. You said you had a lot of spiritual experiences within the church. And I'm wondering now that your beliefs have changed, how you how you view those, how your perspective has shifted from like a, a non-religious point of view. Yeah, it's interesting because I'm trying to do a lot of spiritual work as far as finding out some kind of a a spiritual calmness. Um, I've, you know, found a lot of people, there's a beautiful things about social media. I wish people would stop bashing it because there's so many beautiful things about it. And I have found a lot of resources for being able to just kind of understand how your mind works, how to understand how humanity works, um, understanding um, just intuitiveness and things like that. And, and so I look back on the spiritual experiences, for example, um, you know, you don't know whether it's an example of causation and is that certification? I don't know. But when I joined the Navy and I was just finishing up boot camp and I, they have something that they call a classification. So you go in and you tell your, your company commanders, whoever's in charge, you said, this is what I'd like to do. I, now that I finished boot camp, I would like to go into, I would like to be a medic, for example, or something like that. So I got into classification and they said, well, now that you're done with boot camp, what would you like to do? And I said, well, I'm I'm going to go to photography school and I'm going to be a photographer. And they went, "Mm, no, that's not going to happen because you're only enlisted for three years. And in order to get a guaranteed school, you have to be enlisted for four years. But let me go check your contract. So they went and checked my contract and they came back and said, dang it your recruiter actually put it in your contract that you were guaranteed a school. And so I was like, well, that was great. You know, so I went to school. Then it came time for you to fill out what they call your dream sheet, right? So you've put on where you'd like to be stationed. So I put down, I would like to go to Japan. And they're like, well, that's cute. But number one, you're a girl. Number two, you're only enlisted for three years. There's no way we're going to send you to a foreign station. And sure enough, I got stationed in Japan. And so I had little things like that, um, feelings like, oh, you should go check on your baby. And then going in and finding my daughter, like tipping over the bathtub, like she's just hanging on for dear life Mm. before she falls into the water. As mothers, I think you feel that so often where there's a voice or a, a thought that comes into your head that says, go check on your baby. And you do, and you're like, oh my gosh, thank you, universe, whatever that was. So I had those situations where I felt like somebody was watching over me, but I also love the idea that I don't know who that is. Maybe it's my grandmother. Maybe it's some great, great, great grandmother that I never even met yet that that is watching over me. I don't know what it is, but I love that it's there and that people do have that connection. And it doesn't, again, doesn't have to be a white haired man or some 
obscure ghost that hasn't even been defined that's watching over me. And it's much more loving. I feel more love uh, with this idea that I don't know who you are, but I'm thank you for loving me and watching over me. Yeah. That's beautiful. It comes at a perspective of love and curiosity instead of fear, yeah. where when it's the the gray hair man on a throne, it's you're afraid to do something wrong because you don't want him to punish you. But when it's this undefined thing that you are grateful for, it, it brings those feelings of love and thankfulness yes. instead of shame, guilt, fear. That's exactly. so beautiful. Exactly. Well, this conversation has been amazing. I need to get your Linda Listen moment, your sassy statement to an institution or advice to the listeners, whichever you prefer. You know, I love your Linda Listen. I, I, this is what I would say. And this is what I told my daughter. And I've, all, I, I've heard this too. It's like, look, Linda Listen. You're only going to be 19 or 20 for one time in your whole entire life. You have a beautiful body. Show it off. <laughs> be yourself. If you want to dye your hair pink, dye it pink. You want to shave your head, shave your head. It's only hair. It's only clothing. It's only a one-time experience. You're, you know, and now there's also a danger. I'm not tell, telling anybody to do anything crazy dangerous. Hair is not dangerous. I let my boys have long hair. I let my girls wear, you know, tank tops. Those were all things that it was the one time in their life when they can do it. And it's like, you know what? And I say the same thing to 60 year old women. It's like, look, you're only going to be 60 or 65 or 70 one time in your life. If you've always wanted to dye your hair pink or let your hair go gray. That's another thing I talk about. Yeah. There's so many women out there that are terrified to let their hair go gray because some dogma or belief that society has put on them has told them that they can't. And it's like, yes, you can. So girlfriend, do you, do, you know, you want to get a tattoo, get a tattoo. I don't suggest getting a tattoo on your face. I would probably not do that <laughs> if you could hold off. But if you do it, do it, whatever. But that would be my thing is, Linda, listen, you're only going to be on this earth for a short amount of time. Live it to its fullest and embrace the time you have. I love it. Linda, listen, be you and express yourself. There you go. Thank you for being so open and vulnerable about your story. I'm sure a lot of people will relate to it. And it's just really important to get these stories out there. So I appreciate it. Do you have any final thoughts? Oh, my final thoughts were, I am so honored. And I know it sounds so the cliche when people say that, but truly having listened to yours, I am very honored to be here and to be a guest Aww. of yours for sure. Thank you. That means a lot. I appreciate that. So tell everyone how they can find you and support you. You can find me. My podcast, She Became Visible, is available anywhere that you listen to podcasts. Uh, specifically, you can find it under the Mormon Discussions umbrella if you can't find it uh, uh, sitting on its own. Also, on Gray, Go Gray Dame is one of my YouTube. She Became Visible is my newest. I'm trying to separate my, my uh, influencer section from my ex-Mormon section. And uh, so on YouTube, Go Gray Dame or She Became Visible. And again, under Mormon Discussions, you can find my YouTube. Beautiful. Everyone go check it out, follow her, support her. And if you have the the time and extra funds, would love it if you would support me over on Patreon, patreon.com slash cults to consciousness. Every little bit helps to make the show even better for you guys. So thank you so much for listening. And until next time, follow your highest excitement, be conscious and be well. Thanks for listening. If you like what you hear, it would mean a lot if you could like and subscribe on YouTube and leave a review or a comment to help with our visibility. You can also find me on social media at cults to consciousness or reach out by email at cults to consciousness at gmail.com.